So, like I said, uh, last time I was here as Batman, so I'll be honest, the Worm Honor isn't as exciting as I think Bat says, but uh, we're going to work through your worksheet and we'll have some fun as we go along. So um, I won't ask you to fill it out yourself. Um, I will help you with that. So as we go along, we're actually gonna start with, uh, re let's see, number 11. And here we go. Okay, so we are going to do a worm race. As you may have heard the commercial a while ago, this is my first time teaching worms where I've done it internationally. So we, if we're gonna do it, let's, let's have an international Olympic games, okay? So hopefully some of you have worms. If not, that's okay. I have plenty of worms for everybody. You can root for Team USA. I have different team members that you can root for. Uh, hopefully you have a two by two square feet, uh, square feet of uh, paper. Um, we need to draw a circle that's one foot diameter. The honor asks for you to figure out how fast uh, a worm can travel one foot. So I'm going to race my worms on my paper and you can do the same if you have worms on your paper. Um, so we're going to start off by naming my worms. So Pastor Mark, if you could transfer to my phone. Okay, Pastor Dan, I think that's something you have to do. Okay. Pastor Mark, can you give me a boy's name that starts with A? Um, Adam. Adam, okay. So. Okay, so Pastor Dayan, do we successfully have the worms showing? Uh, I don't yet, Mark. Uh, I'm going to introduce everyone to Adam as soon as we can show it. Can we see that yet? Okay, it's, let me see. I'm trying to see if we can, if that will do it. Does that do it? Mm. I don't know, Pastor Dayan. Does that do it? I'm I'm just co-host, so I don't have. Same here. Same here. I I I pinned. Um, maybe we need to stop sharing his screen first, if that's right. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So here we go. Okay, there we go, Mr. Glenn. It's we have two screens, one showing you and one showing your worm. Okay. So we're going to call our first worm Adam. He's an, actually an African night crawler. Um, even though he's from Africa, like all Americans, we're kind of a we're kind of a mutt of races over here. So uh, he's, he's from Africa, but uh, he lives in the United States. So he's part of Team USA. We're gonna call him Adam. And he's an African night call. So you, if you notice worms um, are really scared of the light. I shouldn't say scared of the light. They actually can't see, they don't have any eyeballs, but they do have light sensors. So they do try to avoid the light when possible. Okay, so we're gonna put him away. We also have, uh, Pastor Mark, could you give me a girl's name that starts with an E? um let's go with eloisa oh okay one i can maybe spell e-l-o-i-s-a it works for me okay and eloisa she is a european night crawler now do you know why i can tell it's a boy or a girl no idea you tell us no clue it doesn't matter uh, worms are what we call hermaphrodites. They have both boy parts and girl parts. So Eloisa, we could have called her a boy, but for the sake of uh, our race, Eloisa is going to be a girl. There you go. So that was a trick question. That's why I didn't know, because I was like well, thinking to myself, I thought they were all, but, huh. Okay, you they, tricked me almost. They have boy parts and girl parts. So everyone is what we call hermaphrodite. Looks like Eloisa is anxious to get started. Okay, how about, uh, let's go with another girl, a girl name that starts with an R. Um, Rochelle. Rochelle. Rochelle, and she is a red wiggler. I've got some of those in my, in my um, compost, my compost bin are red wigglers. Yeah. So I, I have a lot of red wigglers in my basement that I keep in my basement. Actually, they're upstairs right now. Um, and Eloisa, I'm sorry, Red Rochelle, the Red Wiggler, uh, is one of the, what we call it the champion of composters. She loves to, um, to chew up things and compost it and turn it into um, stuff that we need. And we'll talk about that later on. How about a boy's name that starts with an L? 
Larry. Larry. You know, like Veggie Tales, Larry Boy. We'll go that direction, right, Larry Boy? So I'm going to apologize to all Larrys, but if you happen to be named Larry, Larry the Leech. <laughs> oh goodness! I'm not even sure if I spelled that right. L e e or L e a c h? Okay. Um, I think it's a little nervous here. I think Eloise is gone. Is she still there somewhere? Eloisa looks like she's yeah, disappeared. She yeah, she's not too excited about racing here, but uh, or maybe she's over excited. So what I'm going to do, so for you at home, put your worms in the middle of the circle that you've drawn out on your table or on a pa paper. If you can get Larry, Larry may have to start the head because Larry's stuck to the paper. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to start all the worms in the middle and we're going to find out and I'm going to start the, a timer. And we're going to start our presentation. And so you can watch that as we do our presentation. And we will stop our presentation and figure out how fast it takes a worm to get to the edge. So if okay. by chance. Can you scoot your phone camera over just a little bit? Because if you look, the left-hand side of the circle, we can't quite see if they disappear off that side. It also there we go. Much, much better. To... Right there. Yeah. There okay. Mr. Mark, also just to let you know that people on Facebook at the moment, they can only see they can only see Glenn, but not the amazing U.S. war oh, team. No. It's not U.S., it's Olympic, but okay. <laughs> it's Olympic, yeah. Okay, yeah. so is that helping our Facebook friends so that they can see the worms? It's about eight seconds delay, so I'm waiting to see. Okay. All right. Go well, ahead, Glenn. Okay. You know what? We may, we may be able to... Yes, uh, we can see, we can see worms now, but not Glenn, but that's okay. <laughs> That's Looks okay. like Eloise is going to be hitting that real soon. So we may not get very into too many slides. Uh, there was okay, a so one worm running and, away. And you're all right. We're almost there. So <laughs> one minute, one minute and 13 seconds. Uh, yeah, she's across the line. Man, that was fast. Man, she was quick, the European. So one minute, 13 seconds. Okay. Now. Um, the question is, how long did your worm take to get one foot? So we can have one minute, 13 seconds. Now, which is the same as saying 73 seconds, right? 73 seconds, sure. So we're going to do some math. Can you read this on here? I'm asking. No, I yep. So, okay. I see 73. Yep. Okay. So if you turn to uh, number 11, um, let me find. Oh, and go. by okay. the way, by the way, one foot is 29 centimeters. So if you're doing math in centimeters, that's 29 centimeters. Okay. I had 30 and a half, but I guess it depends on what, what part of Google you look at. Yeah. So um, 29 or 30, both are considered. I saw both. So yeah. Okay. I'm going to brush this off so I can write. Don't tell my wife. Um, I just got dirt all over everything. So we're going to look at velocity. The velocity is generally termed as a distance over time. So the distance, we're going to go one foot, and the time was 73 seconds. So Pastor Mark, I, I don't have a calculator handy. I, if I could ask you to do the math for me, we are going to try to convert that from feet per second, um, we have to know that there are 60 seconds for one minute. Yep. Correct? Okay. Yep, and, we and there are 12 inches <coughs> or, third or 30 centimeters. And we know that there's 60 minutes for one hour. Right. And we know that, let's see, second, seconds, minute, minute, or second, second, minute, minute. And so we're going, to, we're going to be stuck with hours, but then we need to convert feet. So there's 5,280 feet per one mile. Right. Okay. So if you could take one. Yep. Divided by 73. So our feet cross out. Times sixty. Uh huh. Times sixty. Uh huh. 
divide by 5,280. Yep. That should be something in miles per hour. What's the answer? Okay, I had converted it to centimeters, so let me go back and do it oh. by... Uh, you can do that too. Meanwhile, I'm going to put our contestants back in some dirt where they would be much happier. I'll sweep the floor later. So I'm Is that the take... answer yes? No, it's still working through your conversion. Oh. One divided by 73 times 60 times 60. Okay, so by... miles per hour is 0.68, which would put it at 1.1 kilometers per hour. Okay, so there's, there's your answer. You can fill in for number 11. So the European Nightcrawler from Team USA got the, got the gold medal. Okay, so can you write it down there on the page right under your miles per hour? Can you put 1.1 kmh? 1.1? Sure. Yeah, 1.1 kmh. All right, hopefully there everybody go. got that. Okay. Makes sense to everybody? And if you could show my screen again. Okay, may I just say that um, I am personally glad that I don't depend on worms to get me anywhere. <laughs> it's amazing how fast they can travel if you get them motivated. We tend to think of them as being lowly animals. Especially when they're, when they're turning things into dirt, we're just applauding them as they move along. Okay, yeah, I'm going to try to share my screen now again. Yep, you should be able to. Okay. All right. So if anyone else had a faster time, let us know and we'll, we'll, we will award you the gold medal. Okay, so we'll skip this. Done all that conversion. Yep. Here we go. Okay. All right. So let's, let's start back at the beginning of your worksheet. So what is a worm? A worm is really a term that I, it's kind of like dad bod. Dad bod doesn't tell you a whole lot about the guy other than he's got a little bit more around his belly than he needs to have. It doesn't, if I told you I have a dad bod, which I, which I do, um, it doesn't tell you if I'm African. It doesn't tell you if I'm Asian. It doesn't tell you if I'm Latino or Caucasian. Um, it just tells you the kind of shape my body is. So worm is, is that kind of a term. It just really defines what kind of shape the animal has. So a worm, if you're filling in the blanks, this is number one, is an elongated soft body invertebrate. So elongated, which means, you know, it's a long skinny thing. It's not a, definitely not a dad bod, it doesn't have a, a gut, elongated. And soft bodied, um, obviously it's squishy and it's invertebrate, which means it has no bones. It's an animal though, okay? So a worm is an elongated soft bodied invertebrate. That's, that's the answer to number one as we're working through this worksheet. Second question, it asks, where do worms live? Well, about anywhere you look, really. So when you look in the water, there are many worms, many different kinds of worms, species out there. Um, we tend to find them if you're looking in your backyard, if you sent your brother out to find a worm for you a while ago. Under rocks is a good place to find them. They like to to go up to the surface where it's kind of cool and maybe damp and the, the moisture condensates. Uh, under soil and leaf debris. Um, so they're down there, munch, munch, munch. They're, they're working to compost um, litter and things that are on the ground to, to make them into to rich organic soil that we'll talk about later. And we don't think about it a lot, but they're inside animals. And if you notice the animal I showed here, it's a human animal. Uh, inside your gut, you have many kinds of worms uh, most of them that you may have are, are not necessarily good. Uh, they're living inside you, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means later, uh, what parasites are, okay? So there are four places that where worms live, and probably more if we really wanted to get scientific about it, but pretty much everywhere. So water, under rocks, soil and leaf debris, and then inside animals. So the next logical question that the honor asks, what do worms eat? Well, it depends on what kind of worm, but 
Uh, I'm going to tell you about mostly earthworms today, but uh, earthworms eat decayed vegetation. And actually, they don't actually eat the vegetation themselves, but they, they eat all the little microbes that, that grow around the vegetation as they, as they decompose. And they facilitate a quicker de decomposition of uh, vegetation. So fruit and vegetables and decayed plants in your gardens, you will, you will find worms hanging around those. They love those. Um, also, one thing that I feed my worms, they eat cardboard, paper sources. Um, so eggshells is something they also eat, but in reality, they don't really digest them. So what happens is they need something. Uh, worms do not have teeth. Earthworms do not have teeth anyway. Um, so they can't chew things. So it's like a chicken. If you've heard of a chicken gizzard, they have a gizzard inside their bellies. So the uh, granulars like, like sand or crushed eggshells or something like that, they actually swallow, but it stays in their gut. So when they process soil and other things, the muscles rub it around and, and able to chew it up that way. So they actually need that something granular like crushed eggshells or sand granulars actually chew their food because they don't have any teeth. Um, also, especially earthworms that we have, they love um, coffee, but actually use coffee. So fresh coffee they don't like because it's too acidic, but once it's already been made into coffee, the coffee grounds, the used coffee grounds um, are pH neutral and they love those, they love to eat those. So everybody at work saves their, saves their coffee grounds for me and I bring those home to feed my worms. And then tea bags, they also love tea bags. So tea bags are, um, you know, depends on the, the actual brand of tea bags. Uh, most can, some can't. They can actually process the paper. Again, they, they like to eat paper. And then inside it's just leaves. So they love to eat the leaves. And, and once it's already been made into tea that they have no more, you know, pH issues and, and the worms love that stuff. So those are things that worms eat, okay? Now, oh yeah, and as we go through here, we, we have some jokes to help, to help move this along a little bit. So, so Pastor Mark, I'm gonna ask you and see if you know. Do you know what you call the worms in Mozart's grave? Oh man, he was a musical guy. So he was into classical music. Um, so it probably has something to do with tuneless or... Um, worming in a grave or i don't know you'll have to tell me i'm, I'm guessing wrongly how about a decomposer how about that? oh all right that, oh okay yeah right. i i get it i get it because mozart composed music yeah got okay. it okay so decomposing yeah okay got it if there was a if there was a groan button in decomposer, zoom i'm sure yeah. I, I'm sure All everybody right. would so be groaning. We talked about this in the least. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can hear them now. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about kingdom phylum class. Uh, we talked about species in, in just seals honor. Um, so if you remember, the very top is kingdom and phylum class. And it's always hard to remember that. So here's how I remember it. Uh, if you've got a good monomic, to, to remember this, uh, put it in the chat room. I'd, I'd love to see uh, what everybody has. It, we As we were preparing this on, it turns out there's lots of different ones out there and they're, some are kind of funny, some, and, and this, one's, this one's appropriate for the honor. Keep ponds clean or frogs get sick. So uh, you remember the coquies, keep, keep ponds clean or frogs get sick. So K, kingdom, P, phylum, C, class, O, order, F, frogs, G, genus, S, species. So the honor asked, which of these do you think that worms belong in? Tick, 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 tick. So kingdom. So the different kingdoms, in case you ask, are prokaryotes, bacterias, basically. Uh, we have plants, we have animals, we have fungi, and we have protozoa. Um, actually, I don't know how to say that word, but we, we call them protozoa. So what do you think, Pastor Mark? Oh. I'm pretty sure that it's not plants, animals, or fungi, but I'm sure there could be a little bit of a debate or thought process because those prokaryotes look kind of wormy shaped, but I'm guessing that that's just because a magnifying glass is going on. So I'm going to have to go guess the protostista or however you say that. I am really glad you're a pastor because you're not very good at biology. It's actually the animal kingdom. 
Really? Yeah. Worms are part of the animal kingdom. So, and then the, the, the honor further ask, so if you remember the, uh, so kingdom, the next level down, the P, the phylum, you know, keep ponds, the P's, which, which, how many phylas of worms are there? So as soon as you get under, all worms are, are animals, but that's about as much as they're really related. Once okay. you get beneath that, you, they split up into 10 different phyla. And there's really three main phyla or that worms that we're familiar with. So we're really going to focus on three of them. But there, are, just so you know, there are 10 phyla of worms. Again, worm is really just a definition of a body type. It's not really, you know, biologically anything. So the phyla, there's anelidas, which are segmented worms. There's nematoda, which are round worms. And there's flatomenthes. I think that's how you say that. And those are flat worms. So at the bottom, you will see three pictures here. Now, as we go through this honor, you will see these caution symbols. And that means that there could be some, some uh, picture there that if you're a little squeamish, maybe you want to look away. So I'm giving you an opportunity to look away. If, if, if anyone's squeamish, you can look away. But of those three pictures, um, there is a, a picture of uh, obviously someone has some sort of worm in their eyeball. Which one would you think an Annelida, a segmented worm, would be? It'd be the one in the lower right. If you notice, it's got the little segments and little rings around. That seemed to be obvious one. And the nematode of the round worms, which uh, tend to be um, uh, parasites. Um, there's a picture of one in, in someone's eyeball. And then the flat worms, which really kind of look like ribbons. So just so you know, the Annelidas have 15,000 different species of worms. Um, and those include the earthworms and leeches. So if you remember our Olympic uh, race that we just had a minute ago, um, those were all uh, from the phyla annelidas because they're segmented worms. The round worms, uh, round worms are 20,000 species. So that, that's there's a lot of different kinds of species out there. And of those, about 15,000 of them were parasites. So not every single one is a parasite, but you know, two thirds of them are, are well more than two thirds. Actually, three quarters of them are uh, are parasites. And so when you, you say were... parasites, do you mean that they basically are inside animals and kind of tearing apart the animal, or or not being terribly nice to the animal that they're living off of? Is that what you mean when you say parasite? Yeah, that that's a good definition. We'll we'll cover that slide here in a minute. But yeah, okay. that's, uh, we're going to learn about parasites. So. Uh, when you when you hear the term hook, roundworms, hookworms, or pinworms, those are all different kinds of parasites that are living inside people that uh, that cause different kinds of problems. And um, the uh, last one, the platymenthes, the flatworms, those also live inside animals. And there's about 25,000 species of flatworms. So if you just look at those three phyla, the 15, 20, and 25. Uh, that's uh, 60,000 different kinds of species. And I didn't even go into the seven different phyla that we, that we didn't really talk about. So there's a lot of different kinds of worms out there that God gave us on this earth. Uh, some good, some seems bad, but, but they all serve their purpose uh, in the overall scheme of everything. Okay, so you ask about parasites. Okay, if you're squeamish, look away. Three, two, one. Here's some pictures of parasites. Uh, the top picture of a parasite is, comes out of a, out of, uh, a grasshopper, um, some sort of a worm. Um, again, we just like the last picture, there is, uh, it's not uncommon to have eyeballs uh, being infected by various worms. I think the lower right hand uh, picture is actually uh, looking inside of the throat, down the throat of a dog. So if they get inside of you, they're, they're not good. So, how do you how do you prevent how do you prevent worms uh, you know from from really infecting us? I mean that's that's something we should really think about. So that's why if you ever heard, I'm going to move to the next slide so everybody can look at the screen again. But how do you prevent parasites or worms specifically from getting inside of us? There, there's many different precautions we can take. Um, we always talk about washing your hands, especially after you go to the toilet. Wash your hands, people. Um, it, your parents aren't saying that just to be mean to you. It's saying that because of, of those pictures you just saw. We, we don't want that to happen. So if you see your buddy coming out of the restroom and not washing his or her hands, you should say, hey, turn around. You don't want worms, do you? So um, that, that's definitely a, a real possibility. 
Another situation, cook your food well. Uh, some food, uh, especially for those that eat pork, uh, if you've ever seen people put like a, like a soda on, on a piece of a pork chop, worms just come crawling out of it. So if when people and fish uh, tends to have a lot of worms in it. So if you don't cook your food pro and even vegetables, if you don't cook your food properly and kill the worms, you could actually be eating live worms. Or if you even if you don't see a worm, there may be worm eggs in there. So you want to make sure you cook it well. So then when you eat it, it doesn't uh, grow inside of you. Um, drink clean water is another thing. So we want to make sure that, you know, if you're out camping, eh, it, just to scoop water out of, the, out of a pond and, and drink is probably not a good thing. We talked about how many species of worms are out there and they are everywhere. So if you drink contaminated water that may have worms or, and, and they can be really tiny worms, you don't even really see them with your eye, uh, eyeball, but they can be there or their eggs can be there and they can hatch inside of you. And so that's, that's not a good thing. So um, keep that in mind. You make sure you boil your water or filter it good if you're out camping. If you were to get worms, uh, see a doctor. Uh, most worms can be can be taken care of with medications. Um, uh, how would you know to go see a doctor um, after you finish using the toilet? Um, if you look in the toilet and if you see white worms coming out of your out of your uh, uh, things that you just put there, that's not a good sign. You should you should go see a doctor uh, about that because you don't want it to turn into something major. Um, some if you see like a red itchy circles on your on your skin somewhere that doesn't seem to be going away and and uh, you know the the typical ointments don't seem to help it that could be a possibility that maybe you have some sort of worms inside of you go see a doctor and uh, if you have sickness or diarrhea that tends to last more than two weeks that's not a good thing go see a doctor um, uh, and probably the final one if you seem to be losing a lot of weight for for no reason like you're not trying to 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 lose weight um, you, you may have worms or something else inside of you. So, so it's not good to get worms inside of you growing. Um, those are called parasites. Um, so the definition of a parasite is, uh, as we look at, let's see, where are we at here? Uh, number five, a parasite is something that lives off of another, usually a larger creature, and we call those creatures a host. So if you have parasites in you, you would be the host in the the worms or whatever is inside you would, would be the parasites. Uh, the parasite gains benefit from the relationship while the host is generally harmed. Examples of parasites include leeches, tapeworms, and nematodes. So, so just to let you know what a parasite is. So would you, would you, Pathfinder, would you be a parasite? Scientists may say no. Your parents might say you might be <laughs> because without them, you would not be able to, to function. Um, you really rely on their support, but uh, do you cause harm to your parents? And hopefully none of you do. So if you don't call, cause harm to your parents, then, you're, then your parents uh, should not be able to call you a, a parasite. But uh, just so you know, that, that's the definition of a parasite. Parasites are not generally good things, um, but for whatever reason, God put them in our creation and, and uh, we have to get through life with them. So there are free living um, creatures. So if you look at number six, a free living creature is any creature that is not a parasite. So if your parent cannot call you a parasite, uh, you would be a free living creature uh, where you are not depending on someone else for your survival. Um, you would be a, a free living creature. Okay, number seven. Um, while we're here, the question asks, which phyla mentioned in question four are free living and parasites? So I didn't, I didn't put more blanks down in this question because it's uh, otherwise you would have been wanting to fill the blanks in, in number four. So on your worksheet, look back at number four. You've got the different phylums, um, the earthworms, the nematodes, and the, and the uh, uh, platyminthes. If you have those, which ones are parasites and which ones are free living? Think about that. So, and this is really, Again, not a perfect question because not all of the nematodes are parasites, but by and large, the majority of the nematodes, let me just actually back up. If you back up to the, uh, there is the Annelidas, the segmented worms, do you think those are parasites or free living? In reality, they're kind of both, but most of them are actually free living. So yeah, that's what I was worm, gonna guess. Yeah, earthworms do not need another animal to live inside of them or that they, that they need to live off of. Um, there are some segmented worms that do, but by and large, most of them are not. The, the round worms, the flat worms, 
actually, let me cover that up. Sorry about that. And then the, the roundworms are, uh, and flatworms, those are both primarily parasites. So when you look at those three phyla, the segmented worms uh, are tend to be free living and the other two tend to be um, parasites. So just go back up to number four and write out beside each one of those that you answered for number four, which ones are, are free living and which ones are parasite. There you go. <laughs> okay. So let me go to the next one. Okay. So where do earthworms live? So earthworms actually live everywhere uh, with the, ex and again, I'm talking about earthworms. Uh, we talked a while ago that worms live everywhere. So even in the, in the coldest regions of the earth, uh, inside animals, they actually live there. But if you're talking about earthworms, earthworms live on every continent, every place that there is, except for places that are completely frozen. Earthworms are primarily water. And so when it freezes, their body freezes too. And so they, they don't tend to survive very well where they get frozen solid for extended periods of time. So um, that brings us to another question for Mark. What did the earthworm scientists discover? He, I see a puzzled look on his face. I'll just uh, go ahead. <laughs> Global warming. Uh, global, global worming. Worming, yes. Okay. Uh, All right. Oh, that's bad, man. That is just, that's a groaner. That's a dad joke if there ever was one. That's what I try to do. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I'm on the mark. <laughs> so I, I do, when I prepare these presentations for you all, I do try to make it uh, uh, more centric to, to your con continents and your countries. But I do want to talk about earthworms in North America because that is a special, um, special story that I think is worthy of telling. So long, long, long time ago, whenever the Ice Age happened, Ice Age affected North America more than, than it did any place on else on Earth for some reason. So when the Ice Age happened, it basically froze out all of the earthworms in North America. So we do have evidence that earthworms existed before the Ice Age but something happened and they disappeared, which, which we believe they, they were froze out as we discussed. So when the uh, first Europeans, so people from your country and other European countries came to the United States or came to what was called North America, they started trying to grow things and they noticed that soil is different over here than it was back home. Um, because there were no earthworms at all, the, uh, there was like a layer of clay down deep and then above the clay was just decayed material. So um, when the tree would drop its leaf, the leaf would lay there and decay naturally over time, and, but it just laid there. It didn't really do anything at all. So the first settlers in the United, into the, the North America uh, started bringing earthworms with them because they realized how important that they were for their gardens. Um, that was the ones on purpose and then the other ones uh, came here by accident. So uh, if you know how ships, uh, when they have the ballast in, they, they basically would fill them full of soil to come over here so that they didn't float too high in the water. They would fill up things from here and take it back to England or wherever they came from, but they would dump soil on the ground and that soil had worms in it. So worms, earthworms started repopulating North America because of the Europeans and everybody else that, that came here looking to, looking to settle and live here. And so over time, it it filled up the, the eastern part of North America. Then, then we, uh, what we call California, our west coast. When settlers started going there, they started taking earthworms over there and started filling in. So there are actually some, still some spots in Canada and North America where, because no one really ever came, the worms really haven't populated. But um, pretty much every earthworm that I were to find, if I and Mark were to find, if we go out and dig in our yards, is an invasive species because it's not native to native to North America because we. Uh, I should say we, the Ice Age froze them out and we, it's, uh, they've done a remarkable job making a comeback. And I'm glad they have. That Not everybody believes that, but uh, I think that they uh, do a wonderful job for our environment and, and, we'll, and we'll talk later about the, the benefits of having worms around. So uh, what do earthworms eat? So I think we're down to uh, A to B if you're, if you're playing along at home. What do earthworms eat? Um, <clears throat> They eat organic materials, basically. So they feed on organic matter found in the soil, such as leaf litter. Uh, then they pass the soil through their gut. And as it goes through their gut, 
um, they actually add nutrients, they extract the nutrients, and then it comes out the other end. Uh, they've mixed the clays with organic material and makes it a very nice, rich soil that they can, that, uh, and it moves it around, it moves it up and down and so forth. But, but they eat organic matter is what they're looking at. Okay, so they convert <coughs> organic matter. So how are earthworms helpful to humans? We just said they eat organic matter, but the, more importantly, they convert organic matter to hummus, hummus, uh, hummus if you, if you like guacamole. But uh, uh, this is, uh, they, they convert that to a uh, soil that not only has the clays in it, but it also has nutrients in it that helps all the plants grow uh, better than they would otherwise. Now here's a here's a mound of uh, castings. Uh, when a worm poops, we call it in castings. Comes out the other end. Here's an example of castings. That's very rich for. If you find that, you can collect that and take that inside and put it in your house plant, and your house plant will will do very well with that because that's that's high in high in um, uh, various things to make it grow. This is probably my favorite worm cartoon ever. Um, this bird says, so you just dig through the soil, consuming nutrients from de decaying organic matter. That actually makes a lot of sense. So you've heard the phrase, the early bird gets the worm. Here's an example where the bird really got the worm. What's what the worm does. So. All right. So the question the, the honor asks is how are earthworms helpful to humans? Um, many ways. So when they, when they dig down through the soil, um, they keep the soil structure open. So that only provides uh, air to get to the roots of plants that grow, but also a uh, drainage. So without worms, every time a gallon of water would fall from the sky, almost a gallon would, would flow off and be run off and cause flooding somewhere. But with the worms able to provide all these little tunnels for water to get into, it can actually, the, the water can actually soak into the soil much better than it would if, if there were no uh, worms around. So that's, uh, uh, they're very helpful to humans. Through, uh, they provide aeration and drainage. We don't really re think about that, but without them, our, our plants would not grow near as well, in addition to the, to the nutrients that they give our plants. Okay, so that's, that's uh, 8C2, aeration and drainage. All right, I wanna tell you a story. Uh, this is about, you probably recognize this picture. This is Charles Darwin. Um, a, uh, Darwin wrote uh, some books that you may be familiar with. Origin of the Species is what we tend to think he's famous for. Um, Charles Darwin was a scientist and he made lots of good observations. But when he looked at those observations, he took them to the way extreme and he, he concluded, concluded that there was no creator God. So I don't really think that his evolution books were that great. In fact, Charles Darwin, when he was alive, didn't think that they were that great either because they weren't selling very well. Um, he was kind of discouraged. He wanted to be known for something great when he, um, as he passed. So he, he wrote his last book, um, uh, and I don't have it here in front of me, but uh, basically it was about worms. His last book was about worms. He was the first scientist to make observations about worms. He talked about how the, they benefited man and how beneficial they were. And it was a runaway success. That book sold more copies than all of his other books combined when he was alive. And uh, he thought he finally would be known for something in life he would, uh, about worms. So um, it's, uh, it's kind of sad that, uh, that uh, we tend to think about Charles Darwin for something else. But this is really something that, that uh, he really thought it was a much better story was, was selling worms. So, um, so why does Charles Darwin always look so sad? I, I guess I, I tend to think that maybe it's because he never knew Jesus. Uh, that would make anybody sad, right? Um, so Mark, here, here's another question. Charles, actually, Charlie's asking the question. Why was the little worm so sad? Um... um you don't know that's all right um yeah I, i'm 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 feeling i'm feeling um like a decomposer here yeah well the little worm was so sad because he found out that his mother went fishing <laughs> oh man all right poor guy yeah that would be sad 
The honor also asked us to uh, how uh, basically the lengths of worms. We talked about uh, earthworms are coming a wide variety of species. How how short are they and how long are they? Um, they are as small as two centimeters. So if you know two centimeters, it's not very big at all. Uh, and, um, and again, we're talking earthworms. If you're talking some of the other parasitic worms, they're so small you can barely see them with your eye. But uh, earthworms can be as small as two centimeters. And actually, there's um, Kind of cool. I, I didn't have any pictures here, but but worms are actually born uh, alive from eggs. So when they actually hatch from eggs, they come out as itsy bitsy tiny worms. It's it's pretty mm -hmm. cute to, to see videos of that. Um, but then they grow larger. So full size uh, adult worms are two centimeters, and then they can be as long as ten feet long. So uh, there's a picture of some of the, the species that you will find, and there's some really cool pictures and videos of people pulling this. I think Australia is where they tend to be, but they. If they pull these worms out. It's just amazingly how long they are. They look like a huge snake. But okay, I want one of the. I want one or two of those from my garden. I bet you my garden would be happier with that thing in it. Could could be so. Um, so that was eight D, and then eight E. So, question is, how many worms are there in one square meter of soil? So, there's actually some a a, a, a new. Uh, uh, maybe not, it's not new, but uh, a term, worms per square meter, WSMs. So 62 WSMs are considered poor soil by agronomists. Uh, 40, 432 worms per square meter is what, what we tend to term as rich soil. And if you have awesome soil for your garden, 62,000 worms per square meter. So I don't know who has to count all those worms, but it just shows that agronomists and people in agriculture understand that the more worms you have in your soil, the better, the more rich your soil is going to be, not only providing aeration and drainage, but then they're also providing nutrients for all the plants that are in there. So wow. the, more worms, the more worms you can encourage to come to your garden, the better off you are. So if you can bury, say, instead of throwing all your veggies in the trash or use veggies and veggie parts, Put them in your garden, bury them in the garden, and encourage worms to come eat on those. And if you have worms eating on uh, decaying vegetation, it makes it better for all of your plants. Okay. Um, so how many species of earthworms are there? Oh, there's another question here. Oh, okay. Um, I actually, because of my, my screen, I can't actually read that. But it, says, what do, it says, what do fishermen Film directors and verma, compo verma composters have in common. I think? would guess it's something about a reel. Well, you're guessing wrong again. So castings. Oh so my rem goodness! Remember when worms go to the bathroom? We call the part that comes out the other end castings. Castings. Right, and a fisherman casts his line, and yeah. of course, people that are part of a film are being cast in that role. Okay, got it. Yeah, you got it. All right. Makes sense now. OK, so the question, the next question, uh, 8F, how many species of worms are there? There are 5,500 different species of earthworms. That sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. Uh -huh. Again, those are just the earthworms, uh, in addition to all the other kinds of worms that are on this earth. The curious thing is, is that um, composting worms. So I have some composting worms in my house, actually. And I'm going to show you in a little bit what those look like. But uh, the composting worms, uh, it's said that there's only about seven of those species that are really have been domesticated. Because most earthworms, or not, I shouldn't say most earthworms, but earthworms have special needs. So some earthworms may, may want just pH of a certain, you know, maybe a high pH or maybe a very low pH, or they may be... Uh, they may feed on a certain kind of plant uh, root or leaf or something like that. Some go very, very deep. Some like it really dry. Some like it really wet. Uh, there's about seven species of those 5,500, so really just a handful, that, are, uh, that live on the surface so we can keep them in trays. And they also have a wide variety of appetites. So we can throw almost anything in there and they tend to love it and like it and we'll, and we'll process it. So we've only found about seven that we actually uh, it can domesticate. And I've, I just showed you uh, three of them earlier, uh, the red worms, the Africans and the European nightcrawlers. So those are three of the ones that, that we have. Okay. 
Um, so, so is that the type? Is that the type of worm that's usually in our garden? Then, like when we're digging in our in our garden in our backyard or whatever, are we usually finding one of those seven, or are we finding other things? Probably other things. So only unless you took your your castings from your composting worms and put them outside in your garden, then you might find some of uh, of the seven. But uh, more likely, you're probably seeing something else. Okay. Uh, there, there's, and so. They say if you want to start composting worms, you can go out and try to get some in your garden, but you're you're most likely going to fail because you take those worms, you bring them inside, and they can't go as deep as they would normally like, or you're feeding them too wet, or you're feeding them something that. So so worms aren't cheap. Uh, as amazing as it sounds, uh, you know I I spend about fifty bucks to buy a thousand of them and have them shipped to me, and and then I put them in my tray and I take care of them. They're they're my pets, so uh, that's that's what I do. For, for, but the cool thing pet. is. I have I have composting as well, and my 500 worms that I started, there's way more than a 500 now. It's like I keep shoveling out shovelfuls, and there's always more than 500 left behind. They they have yep. baby worms, and it it works. They, just, they have eggs, and uh, then we're going to learn about how that works. But they they have eggs and they hatch, and 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 so they make they're always making baby worms. So so uh, the Richard Scary, remember the lowly worm. Uh, he has a question. What's worse than finding a worm in an apple? I know this one. I know this one because I've been there, done that. It's finding half a worm. Exactly. Exactly. That's, 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 that's just kind of gross. Yeah, it's like in a restaurant where somebody says, I found a hair in my food or something. It's like, I'll say, you're lucky. I didn't find mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Clitellum. So clitellum is a term. Um, when you look at an earthworm, there is a wide band that you see on the on the earthworm. So a clitellum is really what we call a thick and granular, a granular uh, section of the worm. So uh, what is clitellum? It's it's a thick and granular section of the body. And what happens is, so we talked about worms having both male and female parts. So when they mate, they line up opposite of each other, and the male will fertilize the female part of each other. And then around the clitellum, actually this mucus comes out around the worm. And so then after they're, they're done um, um, fertilizing the eggs, the worms will separate and the, this granular mucus that comes out from the clitellum will actually, it's like they climb out of it. They will slide through it and the clitellum mucus uh, will form around the, the fertilized eggs and the worm crawls out of it and it leaves what we call the, the egg sac. So the egg sac can include anywhere from, you know, three to 11 worms um, and they grow in there and then they hatch later. They come out as, as actually full grown baby, or I shouldn't say full grown, but they functioning baby worms uh, once they hatch from the eggs. So the eggs we call cocoons and that's a little picture of what's going on there. And the next, next slide, it actually shows some, um, uh, what that looks like uh, when the mucus connects with each other. Um, and uh, so you, clitellum is, is usually good to find on a worm. Uh, most generally, it's, it's whichever end is closest to. That's the head of the, of the worm. It's, it's somewhat difficult. Again, worms don't have faces. They don't have nose. They don't have eyes. You know, it's really just a hole on each end. So, so to know which end is the head, you, you look for the end that's closest to the clitellum. Otherwise, uh, like this little worm in the cartoon here, you're not really sure which end you're talking to. So, okay. All right, hopefully everybody understands that. So the next question asks you to draw a picture of your worm. So here is a, is a drawn picture and I'll give you a, a few minutes to, to do this. But here is, um, again, wherever the clitellum is, the in closest to the clitellum is the head. So we, that's where the mouth is. Uh, that's the anterior section. That's the, that's the head part. Then you have the clitellum. Um, segment. So remember, these are segmented worms. So these earthworms have little segments. And then the hole at the very end, on the posterior end, is, is what we call the anus. And just like you and I, we, we have anuses. Uh, that's where the urn discharges its, its food once it processes it. There's also something in there called sitae. Sitae or sitae, depending on, on uh, which YouTube channel you watch. But those are very hair, they're like tiny, tiny hair bristles. You can't really see them unless you almost look at them with a microscope. 
But when a when an earthworm moves, and we'll discuss how an earthworm moves in a little bit, but it, it basically sticks these bristles out and that keeps the worm from sliding backwards. So okay. it's kind of like if you have a hairbrush and you like smash it down a little bit and you move it one direction, it's hard to move it backwards. That's what the site is doing. It's trying to keep the earthworm from, from going backwards when it wants to go forward. So it's like uh, it's traction like we have on our shoes. Yeah, very, very close. Uh, you know, I, if you can, if you're, if your shoes have little bristles on the ends of them, <laughs> it, it, again, it, it's it's hard to move backwards when you're when you've got that bristle laying when, when, it, when it starts to lay over. It's hard to move backwards. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. If it starts to move backwards, it'll dig into whatever it's digging into. So they're very hard to see, but they are there if you look very closely on a big worm. You you can find them. Um, so while everyone is finishing drawing their worm, we do have another question for for Pastor Mark. What do worms use to leave messages? Um, let me see. Would that be no snail mail? That's not worms. Um, no, no snails are not worms. We heard Someone a guess. Knows. What was the guess? Casca. Cast uh, something. I don't know. Uh, I think Zoom audio is leaving it, letting us down. Go ahead and chat. Put it in the chat window. Okay, I think you're going to have to go ahead and tell us, Mr. Glenn. Compost it notes. Compost it notes. Okay, I like I like Romeo's. The I think I like Romeo's answer too. A casket. Casket. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so how do earthworms move? So earthworms actually have two sets of muscles. They have circular muscles and they have longitudinal muscles. So if you think about an earthworm, so when it's when it squeezes itself, so unlike you and I, we can hold our breath and suck our tummy in, but that doesn't make us any taller. But a worm, that will make longer. So if a worm squeezes itself, it actually will stretch out longer. And so by stretching out longer, it can use its um, sitae to actually grasp whatever. And then it also has longitudinal. So then it, it made itself longer. Now it can like pull its longitudinal muscles and it can shrink up and it can actually move forward again. So, so a worm, uh, actually moves by uh, circular muscles and longitudinal muscles. And so we saw Eloisa in our worm race really use her longitudinal muscles to take off really quickly. She did. She was, she was moving pretty quickly. We're running a little short on time, so I'm not going to show you my leeches, but I do have some leeches. When I have kids here in front of me, they, they like the leeches. And I'll show you what happens. I, I feed them. So leeches, where, where do they live? Um, they prefer warm, shallow water where there's little to no current. So if if uh, you're if you're in a location that has lots of leeches, if uh, say a water, if you sit in a small pool, you're more likely to get leeches attached to you. If uh, if you don't want leeches, you 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 might want to cross in a place where the water is moving quickly because leeches don't prefer moving water. They like to be where it's nice and settled and really tranquil uh, situation. Okay. So what? What do leeches eat? Um, they don't really eat anything per se, but they like to suck on blood. So they will attach themselves to a to another animal, and they will actually uh, they don't kill it per se and swallow it and chew it up as as you would think of somebody eating something. But leeches basically suck on the blood. Um, they they attach themselves. They they do an um, anesthetic almost. Uh, so you don't. I really don't even feel them on you, and they attach themselves to you. Leeches do have some teeth and they will chew into it um, and stick you, if you will, and they'll suck the blood. But then after 20 minutes, they're done with you. So they don't they don't really consume you. They just they just drink a little bit of your blood. Yes, I think so I'm good. Harmful? I Yeah. Uh, so how are harmful to humans? Again, if you're squeamy, you might want to might want to turn your head. Three, two, one. So here's some situations where and, and they're not quite honestly, they're not really harmful because leeches themselves are not poisonous. Um, but what can happen is leeches in their gut, they do not uh, create a situation that, that cleanses their mouth. So uh, if they were exposed to bacteria somewhere else, their gut will keep that bacteria in you. So when they suck your blood, they're transferring that bacteria or virus to you because their gut cannot clean it up. So that's, that's how they can be harmful is if they were exposed to a virus, 
and they attach themselves to you and they're stuck in your blood, you can catch a virus from them, but they didn't necessarily cause it. They just happen to get it from somewhere else. So here's some pictures of what it looks like to have leeches uh, on a, there's a baby's foot. Um, there's the results after the fact they, they may leave a little swelling, but for the most part, they, they don't harm you unless, unless they were infected somewhere else. If you happen to have leeches on you, for one, it's not a big deal. Uh, I'm gonna read through this if, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, don't panic. Leeches, leeches don't transmit disease like we just mentioned and they aren't poisonous. In fact, uh, if you try to remove them uh, and, you, and you do it wrong, that can actually cause problems. So if you remove a leech and say maybe it left its little tongue or maybe part of its head stuck in you, that can cause some problems and make you very sick. So if you have leeches on you, you're really best just to let it finish doing its thing and about 20 minutes it'll be done. So if you find one leech, check for others. There's bound to be several that you got into, um, but the pites are painless. Again, they, they give you an anesthetic. They're very nice about it. Um, just like giving a shot, you know, they rub it and try to make it as painless as possible. Um, and don't worry about blood loss. They're, they don't take very much blood. So again, don't freak out if you have a leech on you, just let it finish doing its thing. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes on most, most kinds of leeches. If you do feel the need that you really have to remove a leech, uh, here's how you do it. You take something like a credit card um, and you basically try to sh shove it out. Uh, again, I, I would recommend against this method because if you, if you leave part of it stuck in you, that can get infected and cause some problems. So once you get it out, flick it out, get it away from you. Otherwise, it'll try to reattach to your skin because it's still hungry. Uh, and then once it's done, you can treat it as needed, just like you would any other scratch or anything else that you have. Uh, with the bandage, the wound, make sure it you know doesn't stay exposed and so forth. But bottom line is, it, obviously don't try to get leeches, but if you do get leeches, it's really not a big thing. Uh, just let it finish doing its job and it'll, it'll, it will detach itself when it's done. Medical leeches. So this is the one I strongly encourage you to turn away if you have a weak stomach. I'm going to show you some pictures of some medical leeches. If I, if I could afford it, I would have medical leeches every time I give this on and just let it suck on kids, just to let them see what happens. But uh, okay, three, two, one. So leeches are very good because what they do is they encourage the flow of blood. So here's a situation where somebody uh, severely uh, had their finger detached or mostly detached. Um, if left alone, there's not enough circulation in the end of the finger and it would that tip of the finger would, would probably go bad. So they use leeches to actually help circulate the, the, the flow of blood uh, places where they need that. And that's, that's why they're, they're still used today. Um, probably not used as much as they used to in the past because they're probably not as beneficial as they once were thought, but they are very beneficial in situations like this where if left alone, say that in this case, a tip of a finger, it would not, it would not do very well. But but when they have a leech on there that's encouraging the flow of blood, that keeps the tissue alive and it will actually heal much better. Okay. That is cool. So what do you so leeches do have teeth, but what do you call a worm with no teeth? Toothless. I don't know. I bet most of the kids know this one. It's a gummy worm. It's a gummy worm. Oh, of course. Of course. Okay. So the last requirement. Um, Find a verse in the Bible where worms are mentioned and demonstrate the story through music, poem, or drama. So here's three locations where you can find worms in the Bible. You can write these down. Jonah 4, 5 through 10. You can find worms mentioned in Job 7, 5. And you can find worms mentioned in Acts 12, 19 through 23. I am not going to read these to you today. I'm going to leave it on your own to look up each of those Bible references and find a story. So again... I have heard some hilarious poems that kids have come up with regarding some of these stories. Um, I, I think I, I do recall a pretty good musical uh, rendition one time that was uh, quite uh, entertaining. So I know Pathfinders, I have taught this on enough times. You guys are very creative. Look at those three stories and, and come up with a music poem or drama and, and talk about uh, what the worms meant in that story, okay? I know we are short on time, but I do want to tell you about my about my pets. Uh, I think uh, worms are the perfect pets. I've had horses and dogs and cats and goats and eat fish and so forth. But um, my worms that I have now, they don't need any babysitters. When I go out of town, I don't have to worry about who's going to watch the worms. 
Um, they're very inexpensive. Um, yeah, I told you how much it costs to buy worms initially, but I can tell you just having a dog taken to the vet, I, a lot more expensive than that. They help me clean up. Um, so instead of putting more stuff in the trash, I can put it in here and, and they can compost it. Um, and they help the environment. So uh, by cleaning up uh, scraps and so forth, they do that. Um, I also uh, get castings and I, last year for Christmas, I gave, I gave little bottles of, or boxes of castings to, to several people and they use them in their flowers and they, they appreciate that. So um, when you feed worms, uh, you need to include several things. So nitrogen and carbon sources. So nitrogens are your, what we call greens. Those would be the kitchen scraps, um, the used coffee grounds, the used tea leaves and so forth. Uh, the carbon sources we call browns, that's the cardboard paper or shredded paper from the, again, I bring that from the office, uh, dead leaves, you can use those. And again, keep in mind, worms don't have teeth, so they need something for grit. I, I use eggshells, I, I save my eggshells when I make eggs for something and I dry them in the oven and then I put them in a blender and so it's a really fine powder that they use, or I also have calcium sand that you can buy at most pet stores. I put some of that in, in my uh, bins and they, and they take care of that. You need to make sure they have good temperatures. I used to have African night crawlers, but they, my temperature in the basement was too, was too cold and they, and they didn't survive very well. Um, moisture, you need good moisture, uh, not wet. Uh, it's been said that uh, worms might be Adventist. You know, they, they, they love a good potluck, vegetarian potluck, and they love the water. So they, so after they have good baptism, they, they like to have a good vegetarian potluck. So they, they might be Adventist. They might be Adventist. There you go. <laughs> uh, light. Uh, again, worms don't have eyes, but they are very sensitive to light. So if you shine a light on worms, they, they tend to disperse. I keep mine in my basement with the exception of right now and so forth. So um, vermicompost is, is very important. So again, I've given this away as Christmas presents. Uh, it's Castings are sometimes called black gold or worm poo, you might hear it referred to. But uh, what happens is it, it's got a lot of microbial activity in it. So as it passes through the worm gut, the worm actually adds some microbes to the, to the uh, soil. And that's very, very helpful for the plants. Notice the picture at the top, you know, without worm castings and with worm castings. It, it's, there's a lot of pictures where people have documented how beneficial these are. Uh, worm castings have a neutral pH, their pH 7.0. That's that's very that's like right down the middle. It's wonderful for plants, and it, um, most importantly, won't burn your plants. So if you were to go to the store and buy fertilizer that you can commonly find off the shelf, uh, and you put too much on your on your plants, it will, well, as they say, burn your plants. So the plants will grow really really quick, and it can't sustain it, and it just it looks like you, you know they were they were dried out or something. They also help with moisture control. So when they, you add water, the, they, they tend to hold moisture very well. So let me grab my phone, show you real quickly how I feed my worms. Or is this even gonna work? Can... Right. Yep, I'm working on it. I'm okay. gonna add it right, there we go. Okay. So here's my worm bin. Uh, it's a clear tote. Most people use uh, colored totes because they're not good for light, but I keep mine in the basement usually, so it's not a big deal. Um, I'm gonna, this is, the other day I, I used a, I just threw a watermelon rind in here because they love, and they've sort of mostly gone, but look at all the worms hanging on it. Uh, you can see paper that I, I put in last week, actually a couple weeks ago. Um, if you could feel this, they're very, very soft and they're, they're working on those, composting them pretty well. Uh, so today I'm not gonna add new paper. But I do have my, uh, um, my wife, she, she uh, uh, puts her vegetables through a juicer every day. So this is about a week old. It's actually got some mold on it. They love that stuff. I don't even know what that used to be. Uh, maybe carrots, probably something from carrots. There's some sprouts. This morning I had a banana for breakfast. I ate most of it. I left some of it so I can show you what it's like to feed those. They love bananas, banana peels. I'm just going to throw that in there. Yep, they will love that. Um, here is here's what the uh, this is one handy. This is what eggshells look like after I grind them up. And so I'll, I'll I'll put some some good grit in there. Worms love the grit, and it also adds calcium. Helps them with calcium. And then 
from work, they, they save, um, they, they keep a bucket by the coffee maker and they leave me the coffee grind. So, so here's the paper. They will even need the paper uh, filters and then throw that coffee in there. They just love it. Once you get everything in there, you kind of turn it all around and mix it up and I'll, I'll do that later. But I do want to show you, here's what the finished product looks like. So this is finished casting. So it's a little on the dry side, but I saved this up and my wife the other day was, she's getting ready to plant something and she told me to make sure to save some, some worm casting for her. So we get people requesting my, my worm poo. Uh, they love it. My worms are, are good natured. They're not noisy. Neighbors don't complain about them. Uh, I can go away and leave them for a couple of weeks and they really produce something that uh, everyone seems to like. So that's what I've got. Uh, I think that's probably near the end of our presentation, if not the end. So anything else I should cover, Mark, or is that about covered?